Good afternoon, everybody. And I hope everybody had some of the wonderful food out there. And I think I've kept Walter away from the food. And you, have you eaten? Yeah. Okay, good, at least. Uh, but there's a lot of good food out there and I'm very impressed. And thank you very, very much, Chainlink. It's, it's an amazing setup out there. Vince, you guys have all outdone yourselves with the Cary Hotel, so amazing. Um, well, we have um, a very interesting panel uh, because we're going to transform post-trade workflows. And yesterday I was actually at FinTech Week um, uh, at the airport um, uh, area and everything you're now seeing is now the institutionalization of um, digital assets. So it's really, really exciting in terms of how everything is moving. And I think these three men here are very right in the middle of it all. So uh, without further ado, let's talk about transforming post-trade workflows um, in a digital world. So I'm gonna ask all three of you um, this question. What do you think the current challenges are in the post-trade process regarding, um, uh, regarding speed, accuracy, um, connectivity? So do you want to, would you like to start first? Uh, this man has uh, grown no, no, the no. largest, or would you like to start Aaron first? Uh, okay. Uh, I yes. recently joined the uh, Tadawul group, which is the uh, Saudi stock exchange. So it's the exchange, the CCP, and then the CSD. But my, I have an experience at Euroclear. I worked almost 15 years there. That's also. where I met him. Uh, and, and five years at BNY. And so each time looking at the market infrastructure, when you think about efficiency, I think the challenges are, the 24-7, mm -hmm. uh, all major broker dealers, they already have operations team that follow the sun. But when you look at the overall market and how to organize liquidity, there's still much to be, be done because obviously not every financial player is across the globe. And so therefore, typically people are stuck to a certain time zone. Uh, I think the other thing is, and you've heard it already in the morning, it's once you would move into uh, DLT, et cetera, it's how do you manage liquidity? Because I, I think there's a big difference between the way the buy side and the sell side uh, look at things. If you and me are uh, investing, we typically have cash. So for us, it makes sense to do an atomic swap because the cash is there and I want my asset immediately. Someone mentioned this morning, uh, buying a fund it takes seven days, so that, that's crazy. I'm, I'm giving my money away and I need to wait a week before I get the... You can get it here in one day. Exactly. So, but if you look at the sell side, it's just the other way around. If you talk to a broker, a broker will say, I'm going to sell you stuff at 105, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to turn to the market and try to buy it at 100. So I'm always short, also on cash. I have, if I'm a big broker, I have perhaps 500 traders they don't know how much they will trade that start of day. So there's got to be a number of trades, and then I need to finance it. I need to get the cash, but I don't know in advance. So I won't keep it aside because that's costing an arm and a leg. So again, from a liquidity perspective, once you go to T plus zero, again, that's going to be a bit uh, of a challenge. So that are the two things I would like to highlight. But I'm sure the Rajiv, do you want to talk about, about it from the banking side and then Aaron will talk about it from the implementation side? Yeah, so I think the way you have to look at is post-trade is sort of the engine yes. uh, that you know sort of runs the capital markets, right? So it's not that it's all manual. The challenge with post-trade is there are too many discrete steps which yeah on their own, run in a reasonably automated fashion, but you'll have to hand over, yeah. right? So if you even manage, let's look at the trade life cycle, right? So the pushing of the order from the client to the broker to the exchange uh, is relatively seamless, yep. right? The fills come back and then you'll have to aggregate fills, split them into a shape the client wants to settle, right? The shape of the orders and the shape of the settlements are not the same. That means there is a process out there that if you're a sophisticated shop, you can automate it. If you're not sophisticated, it's not automated. And then the settlement shape has to jump across a few parties, right? So the client's middle, middle office, the broker's middle office, it needs to go to both their custodians, yes. right? And 
third Lord party clearer too. If it's too, a maybe. different market, then there is a global custodian that mm -hmm. sends to a local custodian. Mm -hmm. It's all messaging, but we all open up the message, interpret the data that we want in a way that we want, right? And we are not looking at the same copy of the data, so we record it into our own data models, so we do not have standard data models mm. yet. So this is primarily, it's not that it's not electronic, but it is not harmonious electronic, right? Mm. It is, there's, there's, everyone has their own data model, you'll have to interpret the data that is coming into you, convert it into your data model, and then of course, right? So there is the control of reconciliation to ensure that your data matches, my data matches, Aaron's data, and then there will be breaks, and then we'll have to go out and, you know, so this is primarily where we spend a lot of calories on in post-trade. Mind you, right, it's not all manual, right? So we do, let's say, 100 million trades, right? Even if 1% of them have some issues. It's getting 99% STP, but 1% is a million trades that needs fixed. And across, like, four. And when you have five parties, running 36 different systems, the probability of one of the system not working on a specific day is reasonably high, which is primarily where then we'll have to basically get into control, reconciliation, breaks, and everything else. That is the challenge, right? So yeah. I think because the front office has become so efficient, we've sort of scaled, 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 right. without basically taking along the middle and back office, the post-trade side of things. So we just talked about the trade life cycle. I, I've not even touched the asset servicing side. It has its own challenges. Can I just ask one quick follow-up question to Rajiv? So what are you doing with the back office then? And that's something if you'd like to touch later, or what are we doing? We, we, yeah. So it's right, so now back office efficiency has sort of become a theme. The good thing about is how do you go about approaching back office efficiencies, right? So, we, and I touched upon it, the, the fundamental issue is we do not have common data models that are agreed within the different entities that participate in the post-trade ecosystem. So that's one way of addressing it. The other way is, okay, how does this common data model propagate itself? And how do you ensure that the same data model is basically available across? So that's primarily that's where distributed ledgers come into play. And now you have infrastructure that can scale. And I'll let Aaron speak yeah. about it because they are the infrastructure providers. And how is Market Node helping your clients actually integrate and deal with all these challenges? Yeah, I think, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it, it starts off firstly actually digitizing the data. You know, a lot of these are processes, sometimes, although as Rajiv mentioned, most things are digital, some things do still go, f they, they just fall down to the lowest common denominator, which is facts, unfortunately, or bits of paper being shipped around the world especially in sort of trade finance. <coughs> so what you have to do is first digitize that data and structure the data. So we're doing a lot of work around OCR technologies, just bringing that data into a common format that we can then think about tokenizing and optimizing. But I mean, the industry's done a, a huge amount of work in this over the last few decades, right? Uh, and there's been a lot of progress made. But unfortunately, it's when you get those reconciliation breaks that people have to think about, what are my, what are my manual processes? How do I resolve these? And unfortunately, you've then got the spaghetti-like problem of who do I call, which party is this, how do, how, do, how do I resolve this? And it needs four or five different people to come together and achieve some sort of consensus on what is the right data, what is the accuracy of that data. And that's where DLT can really come into this. One, because you automatically synchronize that data, you have a golden source. Everybody knows exactly what that record is, what the audit is, where it's been, and where it needs to go next. And then the main point, the sort of the next phase of that on the optimizations is on the smart contract build out, right? So to Rajiv's point, people envisage the data differently. Once it leaves, even if it leaves the DLT space and it moves into a back office system or a middle office system, data models change, workflows change, and then you end up just out of sync. Whereas if you can agree with an industry what the rules of this trade are, right? And they're pretty standard. Law is law, and you know the, 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 the contracts that you have with these organizations, you codify that in smart contracts, and then you, you, you don't have these reconciliation problems. Well, exchanges should actually be helping. Uh, Tatawal and, and HKEX and a number of these exchanges should be helping in this process. 
Um, well, I think they do a great job in sort of bringing the industry parties together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key thing is that you can't optimize these workflows on your own. This isn't a single party problem. Uh, and unfortunately, there aren't many organizations that have the weight behind them to sit the people in a room and say, come on, let's solve this. Uh, and obviously, that's some of the things, as you say, that exchanges can be doing or regulators can be doing is just to drive that efficiency across those different parties. So for all three of you, whoever would like to take this question, the considerations for responsiveness as systems are going faster and faster and faster, even the exchange is tooling up to be faster to tr do its transactions. What are considerations for responsiveness um, and how are you amping everything up uh, in terms of this? And with globally, you have to clear globally with for HSBC. So I think you, you have to basically look at where is the need for responsiveness and traditionally, where did you have the headroom to sort of manage responsiveness, True. right? So f when your order was going ahead and matching, then you needed like low latency, high responsiveness, and the industry basically solved for that. And post that, traditionally, you had three days to figure out the rest of the stuff, <laughs> right? Yes. So, yeah, like, that's exactly, right? So, the capital is always deployed where it is required the most, and it's always scarce. So, the capital was deployed in the front office for efficiencies because you had to basically go out and fight for that nanosecond, millisecond latencies, and you basically got that the fastest done, trade. Right? The out. fastest trade, right? Mm -hmm. And then you invested in, but for the rest of the stuff, you know, for your trade matching, settlement matching, you had three days and that became two days. So you had systems that could basically incrementally improve, right? So you started off with five days, you survived the three-day cycle, you survived the two-day cycle. Now two to one is a significant leap forward. In absolute numbers, it's one day, but you're basically doing going down by 50% of the time that is available, right? So three to two was 33%. Yes. But two to one is a 50% leap. And that is basically when you start to amplify the inefficiencies that are there. post it gets attention because now you are cutting down the time that is available by 50% or more, right? And that's primarily, it, it sort of surfaces and there is risk. Okay. Then, then, then risk gets amplified and you, it, then the, the multi-party coordinated workflow basically gets highlighted and then you realize that it's not an easy fix, a single party cannot fix. And then you start to think about how do you go about sustainably solving, right? So you can't just do local optimization. And we all try, like T plus one tries, tries today because everyone has done their own little bit of local optimization. Try and basically compress that further the systems will keep falling over, right? So there's sure. probably no more headroom for, so you need to basically think completely new ways. And fortunately, I think there are several options that are available, whether we'll go down the path of having common infrastructure, everybody basically using, or everybody runs on a distributed infrastructure with pre-agreed data models. The challenge is always going to be orchestration of a common data model, whether you use distributed ledgers, because a software needs common data model to work consistently. Smart contract is nothing but a software. And it needs the objects that it is working on to be commonly accepted in the ecosystem. Otherwise, it does. It's not but happen. blockchain introduces that at the design level, saying that these are the things that are possible. Walter, you're at Tata Wall and they're, as an exchange, they're the ones that actually set the standard. And HSBC f probably clears trades on Tatawal as well as HKEX and around the world. What are you doing in terms of, from your exchange's point of view, to deal with some of the things and some of the issues that um, I th I think Rajiv has just brought up? And I would like to build on, on what Rajiv is saying, mm -hmm. because we've seen them. It's indeed true. Uh, so that when it was T plus three in the OTC world, so the non-exchange on the stock exchange uh, trade, people would not even match a trade. They will, the broker on both sides or the trader on both sides would just put it in the system. It will filter down in the two organizations at the level of operations and they would send a settlement instruction. 
If that settlement instruction failed because the data was wrong, then it went back to the operations. They climbed up to the middle office and they talked to each other. Oh, perhaps there's a plus and a minus or, you know, dollar and euro, whatever it was. And then it had time enough to go back down again and then again a settlement instruction and now the data was right. Uh, once you move to T plus two and then especially T plus one, what you see in the US where they moved uh, on the equities, it has always been like that because that's where, like the Tadawal group, you have an exchange and then a clearinghouse and a CSD. In the fixed income world, that doesn't exist. But what you see is then when the US moved for the treasuries to two to one, de facto a central piece of market in infrastructure became important, Omgeo. Because uh -huh. suddenly, yeah. wow. what you have is you don't have the time anymore to go two times up and down the ladder. So you need to make sure that you inject on top, and that's Omgeo, which is a trade matching engine, not a settlement engine, a trade matching engine. And so therefore, you centralize a flow, because once it's correct here, it goes centrally down. So you don't need to realign two operational processes with different data models. But the point is, once you centralize on top, you're actually using one data model, which is the data model of an OMGEO, and then it's being enriched. And so that is probably the, the most interesting thing once you move to DLT in a, in a broad way, is to say, yeah, but now we're trying to move to T plus zero. And so that centralized data model, which is today a vertical stack, will be in the DLT horizontally. It has to be aligned. But the good thing is that the industry will have gone through the learning process as it went from T plus two to T plus one. And that's going to be the advantage, but it still will take a lot of effort because as I think Aaron made the point either now or, or in the previous session, uh, you need to, this is a collective effort. This is an ecosystem. By the way, uh, the Euroclears, the CSDs of this world, probably for the last 50 years, five zero years, offer real time settlement. And still the industry needed decades to move from T plus three to T plus two. So it's not about the piece of kit that is able to do it. That's the easy bit. But it's getting that ecosystem and having it organized so that its liquidity, etc., can can process well. And so therefore, but you mentioned that chain of sub-custodians and custodians, etc., that that is done in a much more efficient way. The interesting thing is all of you come from very large organizations and even in Hong Kong, we still have 600 brokers, of which many of which are, are mom and pop shops. So just even moving towards this, um, if there's a typhoon, we shut down the market and we don't shut down the market anymore. That was a huge change in terms of just getting people to change. And I think this is one area that um, technology and as we move faster and faster at T plus zero, or as we move to that, um, on the horizons, Aaron, you're helping a lot of companies do this. What changes can we expect in the post-trade landscape and how do we train the human side yeah. and how do we deal with the banks too? Because banks aren't 24-7 yet. <laughs> and that's what killed um, the connectivity between London Metals Exchange and Hong Kong Futures Exchange. Because yeah. the banks didn't work. Yeah, I mean, the organizations and the banking industry have been built on batches, but there is real-time options available. I think what's Ow, happened is yes. there, there are lots of organizations out there that their business model is based off of making money in those inefficiencies. So there are some players that don't necessarily want to move to a T plus zero. They've got, they've got tech solutions or they've got business models that rely on some of those efficiencies or those reconciliation breaks. But the human element in this, I think, is really important. The technology is generally the easiest part, right? Uh, the technology's been around for a decade. If you go to DLT, you do have to think a little bit about what is that time between me putting something on change and having that block committed, especially if you're on, if you're on public permissionless chains. You've also got to think a little bit more around the policies. There are hidden costs behind some of the public chains with gas fees. A lot of banks just don't have policies for dealing with that right now. And then there is the operational side of this. How do you train your staff on these technologies, especially if you've got 24-7? Where do you put those staff? How do you have handovers between those operations teams around the world? And it's just not something that 
is going to be done in a week or a month, and it's been, it's been decades now. So I think the, the key for us is just to continue to leverage the interest in technology, and mm -hmm. AI now is also driving a lot of this. Even if it's not producing the right technical solutions, what it's doing is forcing board members, shareholders, to ask questions of their senior management about how they can apply technology more and having a technology-first mindset to solve some of the problems. So I would encourage people, even if you're not doing tokenization right now, or you're not applying AI to some of this, use that as leverage to start those conversations and start that investment in the work. Rajiv, one of the things that we were talking about, and you were very excited about where everything is going when we go to T plus zero, it's no longer exception management anymore. What do you envisage out of all of this? And I think the macro, right? So the macro. So, what drives everything is what does the investor expect us? Yes. Right. So, and 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 it's not just the investment experience, right? So, investment experience is part of a customer's life experience, and in the broader life, everybody expects whatever they want, wherever they want whenever they want, right? So that's primarily, that's, that's what we do, right? So you, you get onto an app, you order food, and then it arrives. You get onto an app, you order something on Amazon, you know exactly when it is coming, where it, you can even track. So the macro theme is value is being delivered closer and closer to the moment of demand, right? It's being manufactured, it's being delivered, but the value is coming closer to the moment of demand. And I need exposure to an index, and I want to do it now, right? So I need to be able to swipe out my phone and then swipe in, and two other trends, right? So today we go out to the market and say, I need a unit of exposure, and then I calculate what is the amount of money I need to pay. But largely, I think we are now growing up with investors who have started, to, started their investing journey Right? When I started my investment journey, I was carrying on physical paper certificates, right? So, and then we came on to dematerialized yeah. thing, T plus three. But a bunch of like all my junior staff, they basically began investment journeys with taking two dollar exposure to a digital. It, it was not I want to buy one unit of digital assets. No, I want two dollars worth of digital assets. Now we are basically going into a world where a bunch of investors are going to ask. I need $5, $10, $15 exposure to different things. So what they're going to demand is same, more diversification for the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. That primarily means fundamentally the markets have to change to cater to that. If not us, then someone else will basically offer that experience. And that's because the barriers to technology adoption are not as high in a in a v world where cloud's basically making it easier to adopt, right? So that means there are people who will be good at, you know, delivering that experience by taking appropriate risk. I'm not saying the market structure needs to change if I need to basically get a dollar exposure to S&P 500, right? So there are fractional shares. It's not being done in the right way, but so it, that behavior and that demand will force us all to change. The front office will quickly adjust because they'll basically put risk calculations, there, there will be a risk engine out there that will say, what's your inventory, how much you have at the end of the day? The back office is where you will have a significant amount of pressure because you need to deliver that instantly. And that's going and to be the that is change. basically, yeah. And that will become a differentiator mm -hmm. for the firms that are willing to put in because the marginal cost of tech improvements in the current kit, we're going to lose, right? So mm -hmm. we are basically hit the maximum that you can do with the current kit we have, and we need to start thinking. It's not going to be using the same structures anymore. Got it. And, and I think in that situation, the concept of post-trade might not even exist, right? Yes, so in, it's in not going to be any more post-trade. In, in a decade's it's time, it's just I trade. Yeah. That was it. As post-trade probably will evolve to a lot more of asset servicing and supporting, yep. safekeeping, doing that, rather than the concept of trade life cycle and settlement life cycle might be fused yeah. the more real time you get you know the order matching is the settlement right so yeah. the, that's that's primarily where we are going now less steps so less steps or everything happens structurally in a in a box but in a sequential way right? i only have 53 48 seconds last words 
Last words in terms of what advice would you give for TradFi that wish to move into this new world of instantaneous or make a prediction, well, you can choose either question. Uh, make a prediction for the next five years, where are we seeing post-trade and where are we seeing technology? Someone Salt said it this morning, digitize before you tokenize. It's your point oh. of uh, the data model, but it's also saying if you digitize, you can already address efficiencies and you will have the capabilities to move into tomorrow's world. I would say it's all about picking the right partner to work with, so it's a shameless plug for Market Node here. Okay. <laughs> we'll pick Market Node then. Thank you. Rajiv? So I think we are going to have some time where the old and the new has to coexist, and we'll have to be prepared for that. And then we'll have to carefully transition, right? So it's easy if you think everything will be tokenized, but there are probably hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of assets out there. How do you transition them to new infrastructure? And how do the old and new interoperate with each other? Again, it's an opportunity for organizations like us, yep. Market Node, Thavi Group. And the group. exchange. And yeah. it is an opportunity. That, and the market opportunity is only going to increase if, if everybody had a chance of taking $2 exposure to Hong Kong index every day. I will do that because yep. I'm dollar cost averaging all the time. Well, I am glad you are ending this on a very positive note. So this is very good. And can we give a round of applause to Walter, Rajiv, and Aaron? Thank you very much. Thank you.